Hello and welcome to the Browns Blitz. Today is March 11th, 2021. I am your host, Rod Bloom. Joining me today is my brother, Jeff. How are things going today, Jeff? Doing good, Rod. Good. We have a guest with us today. That is Tim Torch. Tim does the Under the Helmet podcast and writes for the Browns Wire. You can find him on uh, Twitter at uh, it's Tim Torch. You you changed that, Tim, didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if people uh, catch that or not. Um, it, it's funny. I did still actually retain my previous, um, my my previous Twitter handle just under a different uh, account, and that's because, uh, just in case I ever want to go back to it. But I did okay. change it recently just because it was. I I, I don't just talk about uh, NFL. I, I I talk about fantasy football a lot. I talk about life yeah. anymore i have a daughter now i like to put pictures of that um I, I my job is actually in communications now so uh partially in communications so uh, i actually post about my job from time to time as well so it, it's not just me talking about nfl as as much as it used to be so uh i someone actually told me once that while wow, your your twitter handle is pretty pretty great just because it's your name with nfl at the end you don't get those too often anymore so mm -hmm. i th that's why i just definitely yeah, made I sure to, to try to find a find a way to retain it for sure yeah well uh, thanks for thanks for joining us tonight and um yeah i noticed that because it, it took me a little while to find you on twitter when i was looking to contact him like Man, I know I I know I talked to him recently, and I'm looking and I'm looking, I, and it wasn't popping up. So, because um, I was looking for the old handle, but I found you. So, <laughs> glad glad to have you with us tonight. Oh, thank thank you. I'm I'm always excited to talk some Browns uh, in the fantasy football space. People kind of give me a little bit of a hard time because I'm definitely uh, pro pro Browns, and I've liked a lot of what they've done, but uh, I. I, I love the opportunity, especially with everything going on, to talk about the Browns and even this time of year. And I, I'm sure you both uh, both would agree that NFL is becoming such a year round sport. It, it's not a situation where you just have the season and then that's it. They've actually put themselves in a position where there's uh, other than maybe like a, a month or two when you're uh august july right around that time there's there's a slight lull that happens but mm -hmm. other than that i mean they're they're just like going non-stop it's really this this machine that doesn't really seem to take a break yeah there's always something to discuss always something to always some kind of news always uh you know something to figure out or kind of guess what's coming up next so Right now, we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk about free agency for the most part in the Browns, and uh, you know we're we're coming up on it. Uh, you know the the legal tampering period starts on the fifteenth, which is what um, that's Monday. Monday, and then um, free agents uh, can actually be signed Wednesday at uh, four p.m. Uh, officially. So <laughs> we we know it's all kind of like a game because most of the contracts are really done during that legal tampering period. I mean, at least the first batch of them. So, um, so uh, what's the over under on how many um, free agents Andrew Berry has under contract by 401? <laughs> by yeah. 401? Um, I, I would, uh, the over under, I would say would probably be maybe two and a half. There you go. That's a good number. You know, um, I'll let you guys, what, what do you guys, what would you go over or under on that, Tim? Oh, if it's, if it's anything like last year, I, I kind of hope it's a little bit over that number. Um, the beauty of what Andrew Barry really dove into last year, it's it, which I, I think will bear out even more this season is the beauty of the one year deal where, yeah. Where, where you could granted your your roster does get a little bit more turnover with those one year deals. However, uh, I would I would just add that it's nice being able to rotate through guys that that maybe don't have um, 
don't have the track record. They're they're coming at a discount, um, especially in a year where the cap is down so much from what it was originally anticipated to be. Because originally it was anticipated to be somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred million dollars, um, right right around there, give or take um, a few million. But I mean, now they're actually because of COVID and the pandemic and every and not being able to let fans into the stadiums, you're actually seeing a, a dip for the first time in a long time of probably around uh, right around twenty million dollars, um, and and I think that could be where, um, like I said, that one year deal may be even more effective because you just you may have a lot more players seeking one year deals because of the new money that could come in next year with the TV contracts. And they're actually expecting maybe a $40 million bump in the, in, in the salary cap going into the 2022 season. Yeah. So Tim, I think you, you kind of answered, probably answered my next question for you, but the, the players know the situation that you just described. The fans yeah. know it. Um, the, the GMs know it. So typically free agency hits. We see the high dollar guys sign right Mm -hmm. away. And then the other guys kind of sit there for a little while, kind of trying to get the best deals. And eventually they kind of just take what they can get. So it sounds like you think there are more guys that are going to be targeting these one year deals. You think, so do you think more guys are going to sign sooner for a one year deal with a team they like just, just to get it done? You think it would be a lot easier to get a guy signed quicker? I do. Well, I, I, it, that is a loaded question uh, from the Browns aspect, too, because the, this is kind of uncharted territory for the Cleveland Browns uh, versus versus years past. This year, they're, they have a team that's that's on the up. They're up and coming, right? They're mm-hmm. uh, they've been to the playoffs. They actually won a playoff game. They looks like they're in good position in their division. To, to at least compete annually for a division title or, or a wild card spot. So the Browns are, are in a real uh, different kind of situation this year because it's no longer, hey, I need to overpay for all of these guys because I want them to walk through my door at 4 o'clock, 4.01. Yeah. Now they're in the position of these free agents may actually be more likely to come to you and say, hey, I, I, I want to play for your team. I want to be for a, I want to play for a playoff contender. I'm willing to take this one year deal, maybe a little bit less money than somewhere else that has this just flush with cap space and can can overpay me this year, but maybe a longer term less investment. So so I'll come play for the Browns. It, it's it's kind of that weird give and take. And, and the Browns are really in a different position this year than they have been. Uh, since, since I've really dove into football. Yeah, it's definitely different. Uh, do either of you guys expect the Browns to to uh, part ways with anybody else to clear more cap space, you know, before, uh, you know, before uh, next week? What do you think? I really thought that, you know, that uh, another player or two might be let go, but, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Njoku, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, well, you know, I, I don't know. I, I I don't understand how they would how they would get rid of Njoku. Um, that's they 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 could trade him away, um, but trading him away after he probably played some of the best football of his career, and Austin Hooper played some of the worst football of the last couple of years in his career. Uh, that that would be tough for me to really see them part ways. If anything, um, and I'm a big fan of uh, Jack Duffin on on Twitter. I I don't I'll, I'll grab his Twitter handle uh, here in a second, but uh, he he does amazing work just with salary cap numbers. Um, he was actually looking at just if the Browns convert uh, a lot of. Uh, what players are owed to signing bonuses. And he actually kind of forecast and, and not adding any voidable years or anything like that. He actually found a way to create about $35 million in cap space just by doing the conversion uh, to signing bonuses, which is amazing. I, I won't sit here and say, I understand salary cap numbers well enough to really say how all that works. Um, the the only person I could see like a restructure slash parting ways, but this one would even be tough for me, 
is uh, Sheldon Richardson. And the reason I say him, he's got a pretty hefty uh, cap hit this year and a relatively low dead money where you can get out of his contract. But uh, he may, again, just be one of those guys who's in line for restructuring, especially when you're looking at the Browns' defensive line. That's mm-hmm. that's not really a unit right now that's positioned itself to um, just let a guy like Jordan Elliott uh, take over. Larry Ogunjobi is getting ready to walk out the door to see what kind of offer he can get unless the Browns swoop in, which uh, Larry O's... Uh, performance it wasn't, as his, best was not right. his best season definitely uh actually after his rookie season it hasn't been his best year so um yeah. him looking for that big money deal may not actually come to fruition especially in the environment that we're in right now um but sheldon richardson i i think definitely be back i i really think who's on the roster right now is going to stick around i'm interested to see if olivia vernon and en- ends up coming back on a on a discounted deal with a lot of incentives uh, especially with the injury that he sustained really late in the season um of course there's always the hot button topic of uh jarvis landry and, and odell beckham jr the browns currently have i think the third or fourth most cap space dedicated to the wide receiver position in the NFL. And that's, that's tough to sustain. I'm Um, surprised it's not first, honestly, having two pretty much two number one receivers, you know, with those two guys as first, as far as their paycheck anyways. Um, You know, I I don't think, yeah, I don't think anybody would debate that. The, the big moves that just cap happened that kind of shifted the landscape a little bit was, uh, was Tampa Bay. Uh, franchise tagging Chris Godwin oh, yeah. and, and keeping him around. So that shot up that number. Uh, Mike Williams was franchise tagged in uh, with the, with the chargers as well. So they, uh, both of those teams jumped right ahead of the Browns. Yeah, that makes a big difference. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think, yeah, Sheldon Richardson's due to make 13 million. Um, you know, we've, we've gone through on this show, the entire roster and, by position as far as money doing everything or over the last what four weeks jeff i think yeah. four or five weeks um yeah and and i think we the thing with richardson is he's making pretty much what he made last season it's not like the number shooting up um it's just the fact that they could part ways with that minimal cap hit if they really decided they wanted to clear money but um, i think what you say about restructuring is is a definite possibility and something everybody would probably be happy with you know assuming that richardson wants to do that uh, the thing with uh the thing with njoku is i th- i think he's some, due somewhere around six million and his his cap hit is minimal too that's why i brought him up because the browns could part ways and and i don't i don't know if there's any cap hit if they let him go so um you know and, and i think they like the other two tight ends but, you know, he's still on the roster, so maybe they're looking at doing something with him, too. So um, I did want to just mention the uh, the tight end or the uh, the tight ends, the uh, the free agents that that um, the Browns have or that were on the roster last season. And, uh, you know, Jeff and I have kind of gone through these, but I'll, Jeff, I'll kind of let you jump in and summarize kind of guys you thought the Browns might go after again. And, Tim, I just want to get your thoughts on guys that you – maybe that you didn't just talk about already. So um, Richard Higgins is one. Do um, you think Browns have an in, will have an interest at some point in going back after Higgins? And if so, when? Um, why don't we just talk about Higgins real quick? Yeah, he uh, he did show good, especially with Odell Beckham Jr. out. I, I do think there's a definite chemistry. It, it's unfortunate if the chemistry with Higgins was actually with Beckham. I, I would prefer that. <laughs> uh, that yeah. that would make um, would make the decision a lot easier. I I'm personally okay parting ways with Sh- Rashard Higgins, and that that again is probably not the most popular take among the Browns fan base. And the reason I say that is I, I need explosiveness in this in this Browns team. Right now you have Jarvis Landry, who is a non-blocking tight end that, that's out there. You have Odell Beckham Jr., who is coming off a, a pretty significant injury. You're hoping he 
uh, he's doing better. I need someone to get vertical. And I don't want to really put my chips on Donovan Peoples Jones taking uh, taking a a significant leap as a day three drafted player. Uh-huh. I I need speed on this team. Um, so whether it's bringing in a guy like John Brown, uh, who was recently released from the Buffalo Bills, uh, having yeah. Brashad Perriman come back. Uh, that that would be a more significant impact to me. I don't need another player who's playing close to the line of scrimmage and bringing defenses down into the box for what what is the what by a lot of statistics is the best offensive line in the NFL and probably the best duo of running backs in the NFL. I, yeah. I want to find ways to spread out teams so that they can't just focus on what we're trying to do. Okay. I, I have to ask both of you guys, did you see the footage of Odell on the, um, on the treadmill today? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not. Um, Odell, there's a uh, kind of going viral. Odell, in his rehab running on a treadmill and it Mm. looks like he's running very fast Mm. so he looks good you know when uh when stefanski said you know last week that odell looked good i'm like well yeah you know he's gonna say that i don't know what that means does he that mean he's hobbling around and his crutch is okay or you know or what (laughs) well he you know he (laughs) he's running Okay, yeah. guys. So um, the the running's great. Um, I w- with ACL injuries, it's it's the cutting that uh-huh. that I'm more interested in. It, it's great he's running. I mean, by this point, I I would hope we're we're at least getting there. But boy, I need I, I need to see cuts. It's it's some time in the very near future. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure he's. Uh, I'm sure he has a ways to go, but um, it, it kind of caught me a little bit off guard, you know, that he's that he's come this far at this point, um, you know, because my uh, my my curiosity was kind of getting to to wonder with an injury like this, you know, what kind of chance there was that he would be effective at all this coming season. And, you know, by seeing this, it, it leads me to believe that there's, you know, there's a good chance that he could. You know, he could definitely be back, um, you know, to he's, being himself. He, he's season. what, five months into what's generally considered to be a nine to 12 month rehab, right? Yeah, that, that's what I was looking up to just to make sure my, uh, just to make sure I was kind of on point. Uh, he injured himself Octo- o- October 25th. Oh, October? Yep. Or, yeah. yeah, so not even five months in. Um, and you know, a little early to read much into his rehab, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I just, um, uh, you guys just need to watch the, uh, the video. Uh, he he <laughs> looks just, like he's running a lot faster than a guy who tore his ACL that, that those, that few months ago. Um, yeah, would be. well, you uh, know, I saw, <laughs> I saw a lot of his videos early on, um, you know, as he was going through range of motion stuff early on. And I mean, there's no question he's, you know, he was working hard at it. So I would expect that, you know, he's going to, he's going to be ready. Um, yeah. You know, just a question of to what level he can return. I, hopefully it's a hundred percent. I just want to yeah. complete the thought on Richard Higgins real quick. Yeah. Um, you know, we did mention uh, a few shows back um, that um, Richard, I, I thought, you know, last season that the Browns wouldn't bring him back. Um, this season, I, I still kind of don't think they'll bring him back. But um, I think what, what Tim was saying about needing a different kind of receiver uh, is interesting because as, as I was doing the research, looking at um, all of the, the free agents, um, most of the people writing articles, most of the sites um, that list the Browns needs list wide receiver as one of our primary needs, um, which is kind of funny when you juxtapose that against what we were talking about earlier, what Tim was talking about earlier about, you know, we're a top three team and salary committed to that position. So, yeah, um, because of two guys. Yeah. It's all, it, yeah, it kind of doesn't make sense to me that, you know, we, we've, we need to go out and f- find a free agent 
wide receiver that can provide a need that we don't already have when we're already committed that kind of money to the position. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's really, it's really the questions that, that really bear out everything. Because if you didn't have questions about Odell Beckham Jr., granted, he put that video out, but uh, you also find yourself asking, uh, is he going to be on the pup for any for any significant period of time? Mm-hmm. If he is, then you better, <laughs> at 401, there better be another wide receiver getting ready to walk through the door. Uh, and, and just so many other... Uh, well, if you want to win games early in the season, right? Yeah, well, if you're, if, you're, yeah. if you're contending for a Super Bowl, those early games are just as important. Right. And, um, and they yeah. obviously obviously won games without Odell Beckham Jr. being there last year. But to to make it so part of my concern going from year one to year two, uh, especially with this team, this offense is you don't want the book to already be written. One of my one of my favorite things about uh, Coach Stefanski when he came in was that uh, I remember reading an article that he would always take the top uh, top 10 plays from all across the NFL and show it to his team and break them down and and try to find different ways to incorporate that and exploit see how teams were being exploited and and just different uh, different ways to really uh, manipulate the field or or use personnel in different ways and that was probably one of the most exciting things I had heard just from the head coaching standpoint I know it's not a big beat I'm sure every coach takes takes film and looks at it every week. But when I hear that, I'm saying, I'm thinking to myself that this coach does not want his team to just be one dimensional. He does not just want to be a play action zone team. He wants to be uh, very uh, multiple in his approach. He wants to be able to have different types of weapons for different situations. There's a reason he likes using 12 personnel and having two tight ends on the field and there. And, and that's, that's also kind of why I, I like and Joku being on the roster because versus even Harrison Bryant, he is he is definitely a superior athlete. And when I talk about someone stretching the field, I it is obvious that Njoku can stretch the field easier because of his physical traits versus an Austin Hooper or a Harrison Bryant. Yeah, so let's let's shift to uh to Terrence Mitchell and let's kind of use that to work into the to the cornerback free agent market. Um, you know, Terrence Mitchell played. I th- I'm going from memory here, but I think he played like a thousand snaps last season. Okay, mm-hmm. so it, it it's a big hole to fill. Um, you know, and and I think he's really playing out of position being that number two corner. Um, quite a few good corners on the market. And, you know, and, and I'm sure there are a lot of good corners in the draft, too. Um, I guess the question is, you know, where's where's the best value? Um, do you do you want to try to bring somebody back on a favorable contract uh, who you know and like? Uh, do you want to try to upgrade that? And, of course, the Browns, you know, they, they've got the questions of, you know, of Greedy and, and uh, his – his injury, how, how well is he going to play after the injury, and did he really even prove himself before the injury? Um, so the Browns really have to take this this cornerback position very seriously, um, you know, op- opposite, of, opposite of Denzel Ward, um, and, you know, and his extending him is a whole other issue. So, um, so, so, Tim, what are your thoughts about, uh, about Terrence Mitchell – and if, if you had your way, you know, not who do you want, because, you know, obviously it's money related too. but, you know, uh, what kind of guy are you going after? What do you think, what do you see the Browns doing at corner? Yeah, uh, Terrence Mitchell, it, it's all about cost. I, I do agree that he's probably better suited as your corner cornerback three, four uh, on down the list versus your cornerback two, defensive back two. Um, mm-hmm. For me, the the entire secondary is really, uh, really a question mark for me at, at, at this point. And I'm, I'm of a firm believer it's quantity over quality. I, I need to bring in as many bodies as I can to, to really f- 
fill up this room and I don't need them all to be standout stellar Patrick Peterson type of uh, type of caliber. I'm OK yeah. bringing bring in. Actually, the Browns gave us the blue blueprint of the type of guys that they're most interested in. They like young guys who maybe have a little bit more potential than what they've shown so far. Uh, and also guys who have been uh, highly drafted at, at different points. Um uh, when when they went through the NFL draft process, so so there are plenty of those types that are actually going to be sitting out there. I'm thinking of the like Chidobe Awuzie uh, that that would be coming from the Dallas Cowboys, who was drafted in the second round, or Desmond King. But both of those guys have solid physical traits that were drafted highly mm-hmm. when they came into the process, and can come in and be that athlete and really develop. And I wouldn't even care if, if Joe Woods tried to find ways to maybe dip into his past, whether um, I I think it was when he was with the San Francisco 49ers, if he tried to bring in a Richard Sherman, just as kind of a stopgap. again, all of these guys I think would be that one year deal type of player and could come in and and start quickly. The only place where I would be a little bit more comfortable spending the money would be at safety. Um, There's a lot of quality names um, towards the top of the list, a lot fewer after the tag. Uh, Unfortunately, that we uh, really don't get to, that we really don't get to uh, try to take a bite out of, but I, I would be more comfortable dipping into that safety market because whereas we have Denzel Ward right there, defensive back one, I, I have a lot of questions of where we are at safety. That room is barren. I'm not playing. I'm not guaranteeing Grant Delpit is going to be back and, and just ready to play. So that mm-hmm. room is empty for for all I know at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I I like that answer. Sign them all as many yeah. as you can. <laughs> yeah, but I agree. Versus signing, you know, trying to sign one you know, one of the top guys to, you know, uh, you know, the top corner out there to, a, to a big, well, here's contract. the problem, Rod, the, the, the top about 10 or 15 free agent cornerbacks are all 30 plus or, or approaching. Um, so oh, I mean, mid to late really 20s. Fit, yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. I mean, a couple guys in their late twenties, but mostly it's, it's guys that are pretty well seasoned. And, you know, I mean, that, that gives you a short term answer, but, um, I don't know that that really fits with what the Browns are trying to do. And, and, and to, I, I, to Tim's point, it's not, that's not the position to do that. at. And, and I also like kind of the, the Patriots way of doing things. And this, um, this is going to be a little bit different because we do already have a, a stud on the defensive line and miles Garrett, but kind of what I, the old Patriots, well, the newer way of Patriots doing things is just be good enough up front. Just be good enough along the defensive line that, and everyone having doing their assignments that that you're not just constantly getting gashed and, and pushed around. But really the focus of what you should be is on that third level of defense. That if, if guys are just doing enough at, at the actual line of scrimmage, then be elite in coverage. That that's really what I would rather you have, and, and that's why I feel like you need, really need to throw that quantity of bodies into your into your secondary, especially if you're starting to hear more and more talk about the the Browns running the four two five. So so it's more of a nickel type of, for their base defense. Boy, you you better have bodies on top of bodies just walking through that door. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Here's the so, other statistic about the top cornerbacks, Rod. Um, very few of them played north of fifty percent of the snaps. Oh, I know a lot of those guys have been they get hurt all been the time. injured, inconsistent. Yeah, right, um, right. Yeah, definitely. I don't know. If you want to spend big money on any of those guys? So yeah, I I agree with you guys. Let's look at like William Jackson. I mean, he's either been hurt, or, you know, or inconsistent. Good season, not a bad season. Um, I don't know how much money you want to throw throw you know his direction. That's kind of. Um, that doesn't seem like something the Browns would do. So let's let's talk safety then. And yeah, um, you know the thing is, guys, you got to have so many lists up here. I was looking at I had a list up of guys who have been tagged, and I think uh, Justin Simmons and Marcus May they were both tagged, right? So, yep. um, 
Uh, let's see. Anthony Harris was not tagged, right? No. No. He was not tagged, and John Johnson was not tagged. So I think those two guys are still available. So um, so let's just talk safety. I mean, yeah, I think the Browns, Browns have a big need there, and, and I agree 100%, Tim. You can't count on Grant Delpit, man. If he comes back and he plays like a stud this season, it's going to be great. Okay, but the Browns have to make plans to the contrary. Uh, and uh, um, you know, I, I think they just it, and they also need to just get a bunch of bodies in camp, especially if they're if they're going to be playing five defensive backs. So man, you got you got to stock up on these guys. So so who are your favorites at, at safety? And Jeff, you want to kick this off? I I think you've got probably a, a guy or two listed. Well, yeah, when I went through this exercise, I was kind of thinking, you know, if I'm the GM and, and I'm going to go out and do due diligence on some guys, I'm going to kind of break it down based on where we think we're going to be at each position. Um, so I, I came up with four guys at each position, and, and safety is – you know, one of the top three areas of need in my mind behind linebacker and edge. Um, so I have a value guy, a quality guy, a premium guy, and a wild card. So uh, at the safety position, my value guy, and, and, and I, call, I consider this a two to three million dollar guy, uh, would be Rayshon Jenkins from the Chargers, uh, who's a true coverage guy, uh, played 83% of the snaps last year. Um, my quality guy, is uh, you know five to eight million dollar a year safety, and, and that that's how I'm looking at this. Okay, what are, what are we committing to the position? Um, so that's Jerron Harmon of, from Detroit, uh, another true free safety, a uh, little older than Jenkins. Jenkins is 27, Harmon is 30. If you're going to bring in somebody that you know you can count on to be back there, he played 98 percent of the snaps last year. Um, I don't know if these are the right guys. I'm just looking at this is the type of guy that I would plug in here. Um, and then the premium guy, obviously, is Anthony Harris. I mean, the guy played 100 percent of the snaps last year, but he's going to cost you, you know, 11 to 12 million dollars. You know, and, you know, are you willing to commit that kind of money to a to a starter at safety? Um, I think the wild card for me is a guy like Trey Boston uh, from the Panthers. He was just released from a, a three year contract. He was moved. Um, you know, early in his career, he was more of a coverage safety, and they asked him to play a lot in the box last year, and that was a miserable failure. Um, you know, maybe putting him back in the kind of role that we need, um, you know, he, he's able to flourish again. 28 years old, um, you know, could probably be in that 5 to $6 million range. I honestly think that's more the kind of guy we're going to end up with. I don't see us going out and breaking the bank at safety knowing that we've got a couple of young guys that we want to give a lot of snaps to and develop. Tim, let's get your feedback on, on all that. Yeah, it, it's, it's a great list. Um, I, I think a lot of what was, what he mentioned are, are the names everyone's seeing right now. Um, John Johnson is a great name to mention. Uh, again, he's probably more towards the higher, higher end. Um, I think if you're a safety, then you should <laughs> you should at least be considered for the for the Browns right now, just because they mm -hmm. it's and I, I know I'm probably going to sound like a broken record. It it really is a depleted room. I I mean you have Anderson Sandejo that that's going away, not not really a massive loss there, but okay. Uh, Carl Joseph, I I would be okay if he returned, but he's more of a in the box guy versus versus someone who you're going to really um, trust in pure coverage. Uh, Malik that's Hooker, what we've pretty much talked about all year, Tim, is that you yeah. know we didn't have that true coverage safety on the right. roster. Right. Yeah. Um, Malik Hooker, uh, are, can he kind of regain that form that he had when he was coming out of Ohio State and before all the injuries? Uh, boy, I'd yeah. be willing to take a shot there. Uh, Keanu Neal, yeah. in my, I mean, Malik Hooker and Keanu Neal really fit those two uh, kind of, I was, I was talking, looking back at what the Browns did in their first season, young, when you're talking about Keanu Neal and Malik Hooker, you have two young guys who are right around 25, 26 years old. And then you also have the draft pedigree. So those two guys 
feel like, in my opinion, and and maybe you disagree, are, are really kind of two prime guys I could see them diving into just quickly because because they fit so many of those benchmarks that that the Browns front office already likes to hit. Uh, I do, I do agree with you on Trey Boston. I think he was uh, misutilized when he was with Carolina um, going into year two, year one, he actually was used appropriately as more of a single high guy. Um, But going into year two, he was used as more of a in the box role, which, which is definitely not what you're, you want to see from him. You want to see him as single high. You want to see him maybe drop down into the slot a little bit. And and that's what we need. I, I've been hoping for Trey Boston here in Cleveland for the last, I think three years. And it just hasn't happened. (laughs) I'm kind of excited just going over his list with you guys. Uh, you know, honestly, all these guys that are out there, I figure the Browns have to end up with somebody good, right? <laughs> it's amazing, the, the the free agents this year. And, and it, you know, talking earlier about how this is such a unique year with the change in the cap. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just gonna, I think it's going to be um, interesting to see how the market sets itself, you know, and, and when, you know, and how teams adjust some of their decision-making process based on that, you know, maybe, maybe guys get, get cut that wouldn't have gotten cut or vice versa uh, just based on what the free agent market does. You know, when you see, I think I mentioned 76 free agent edge rushers, <laughs> these are crazy numbers, you know? Yeah. There, there have to be a lot of, you know, uh, I would think that, uh, that the Browns are going to find their way into some nice deals for some of these guys, especially and, this season. And like, and like you're saying, Tim, one year deals, especially. Uh, I, I, I think it's that. also important to, to take a look at the teams who, who are still dealing with salary cap issues. You, as it stands today, we currently have nine teams that still aren't under, under the current salary cap. And, to me, that may be one other exploitable opportunity to where you can go to those different teams and say, you know what, I, I have salary cap space available. Let's make something work so you can shed salary cap. I can get an effective player. I, I'm not I'm not saying we're looking at a Brock Osweiler type of deal, uh, even though I looking back, that's still one of my favorite uh, trades that I've ever seen happen the, <laughs> the way that they just took on that salary cap hit for for a draft pick that that was genius in my opinion but I mean between the Lions Chiefs Buccaneers Packers Falcons Eagles Bears Saints and Rams you you could have a real opportunity to start picking out some some decent talent talent from those teams trying to get below the salary cap mm-hmm yeah, teams are letting more and more guys go right now. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's it's hard to say these let these free agent lists are just going going to continue to grow. You know, it, in the it, next it, week. it's also crazy. Four of those teams are over seventeen million above the salary cap right now. Yeah, that's it, that's a lot. I mean, and granted, the salary cap is what it is. You can always play those number gymnastics, but but at some time the 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 bill always comes due and and it's just whether or not these teams are willing to pay it. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's uh let's move to linebacker and you know it's kind of, it's interesting because when I'm going back a few weeks and and the talk about who the Browns needed to go after the two names you heard the most were JJ Watt and Levante David. These are the guys the Browns need to go after. Well, they're not getting either one of those guys. Um, mm. and, you know, J.J. Watt signed uh, and Levante David. I'm not saying, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not lumping uh, J.J. Watt in as a linebacker, guys. But um, Levante David signed. Uh, Matt Milano just signed. Mm-hmm. So um, I think like a four-year extension. Those were the top two linebackers on the market. So um, linebackers... Thin again at free agent, uh, but that's pretty typical. <laughs> that's kind of how the NFL is. Good linebackers don't move around a heck of a lot because they're hard to find, it seems like now. So, um, you, I think with the Browns uh, going likely, you know, four two five 
you know, I don't think linebacker is as big of an issue. Uh, if they're if they're to go after a linebacker, any thoughts on what they would do there, Tim? Yeah, uh, the, I I don't think they're going to go after linebacker. Uh, personally, this this team has uh, over their over this regime, and then also before, they have not really shown the willingness to really uh, really extend themselves or or to spend significant assets on this position, um, which which I think is fine. Uh, linebacker is actually one of those positions where you you can be just average. It's okay. You can you can be BJ Goodson level okay across the board and still make it work. And, and that's really where I would prefer them to dip in a middle rounds of the dra- middle to late rounds of the draft and try to try to pick up a little bit of value because I, I don't really feel like that's where you win in free agency. That's not where you win uh, spending significant capital from your team uh, but if, but if you're going to invest just uh, I, I guess the biggest thing I can say is just make sure you're investing in players who can be athletic uh, players who can um, uh, like uh, Jayon Brown uh, he's mm-hmm. someone who's kind of a uh, he is a a coverage linebacker. If you're going to really expend those type of resources, that's the type I want. But, but again, you just have to ask yourself, are you willing to make that type of investment in someone who's, who I I think will get paid, will be one of those players. If anything, I would much rather go on a cheaper deal with someone who's just consistent, like a KJ, Wright. I feel like that might be the sweet spot for the Cleveland Browns because he's, he's good enough. He can at least set the bar for you or I'm also okay. Bringing back BJ Goodson. Yeah. Yeah. Jay on Brown is probably the the top guy left out there and KJ Wright's getting up there a little bit. He might not demand, you know, as big a contract. So um, it's interesting to, to look at, these guys, um, I see Matt Milano as a younger version of Joe Schobert. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, we had that guy, you know, the, <laughs> the good single coverage linebacker um, who was no, not necessarily very solid in the run game. Um, but, you know, he went and got his money elsewhere. Um, you know, Jayon Brown is kind of in that same mold, but more in, in the zone scheme. Um, I just, you know, looking at the guys that are out there, I don't know that there's anybody that's a substantial right. upgrade over BJ Goods. <laughs> yeah. And that's, you, you know, you, you're not going to, you're not going to be excited about it. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, guys, I, uh, uh, Doug Doug Lane Maurice had an article out where he kind of went through what he thought the Browns would do, you know, or just kind of his little snapshot, and he came up with with the following combination of of moves, and he had the Browns signing Anthony Harris, making the big splash at, at safety, he had him bringing back B.J. Goodson, um, he had him signing uh, Tack McKinley at edge, and signing uh, Mike Hilton. At slot corner, so that's kind of how he saw it. Um, mm-hmm. Guys, we've talked about most of those guys. Um, uh, uh, another good guy to consider, um, just just since we are putting out a couple of names, a uh, guy who was over in Minnesota, only twenty six years old, Eric Wilson. Uh, according to PFF, he had a coverage grade of uh, sixty five point five, which is pretty solid for someone who uh, for someone who uh, was was in a limited role. He he's the type of guy that I think you could dive into that young um, athletic player who could really uh, take steps forward throughout the rest of his career. 96% yeah. of the snaps last year. I, I like him already. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think, I think that's what the Browns want to do at linebackers. Try to get more, um, you know, more, more speed. Uh, more, you know, more. The more athletic they can get a linebacker, the better. Yep. So yeah, guys who can cover and, and have better speed um, works works for me. <laughs> so um, let's uh, 
let's go a little bit more in depth on on edge guys because uh <laughs> i think we feel like uh at least when when we talk defensive line um the browns the browns are really in a spot where or they were they would they would really uh, uh benefit greatly from having somebody opposite of miles for several reasons it just um, I think Jeff said, you know, that Jeff kind of said it in a way that, you know, the Browns just kind of scream for a free agent signing it at defensive end. So, mm-hmm. so let's, uh, let's, let's move into the defensive ends or edge rushers, um, you know, lump them all together. Uh, Jeff, who, who are some of the guys you have down and, and who do you see as, you know, good possibilities or guys that you would like? Like to come in, or uh, guys you think the Browns might go after? Slipping my my GM hat back on again. Yeah. Um, my my uneducated GM hat. Um, my value guy I came up with is Carl Lawson from the Bengals. Um, you know, he's not a strong run stopper, but he's a guy that I think can get after the quarterback. Um, the thing I like about him is, you know, he, he had five and a half sacks and four tackle for losses, but he had thirty two quarterback hits last year. I had to check that because I thought it was like a typo. Um, the guy dominated from a, the point of inflicting pain on the quarterback, and you know that would look nice opposite Miles, uh, young guy, you know, in the five five to ten million a year range. Um, the quality guy, um, Leonard Floyd from the Rams, ten and a half sacks, eleven tackles for losses, nineteen quarterback hits, um, former first rounder. Played 89% of the snaps last year. Uh, big, big, strong guy. Uh, he's going to cost you 10 to $15 million. Um, and then the, the premium guy, uh, Matt Juden from the Ravens. I like the idea of taking him from the Ravens, probably more than I like the idea of him playing for us. Um, but he's the kind of player that we could assign to Lamar um, and potentially uh, be that solution that you and I have talked a lot about, uh, the Browns needing. Um, and then my wild card would be uh, Hassan Reddick, um, another guy who um, probably was playing out of position early on in his career, um, moved to edge last year. He's a, a undersized guy, relies on speed, um, but, you know, turned in 12 and a half sacks last year. So um, I think, you'd, you know, again, be a nice compliment to, to what Miles can do on the other end of the line. Yeah. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, it's, it's a great list. There, there's, there's just so many names. I, I also agree that they need someone. Um, uh, again, it, it's always where do you want to allocate your, your assets? It's just like, it's just like in your household. Where do you want to? Where do you really want to spend the money? It mm-hmm. Is do you do you want to go go hard with, uh, with buying video games, or do you want to, <laughs> or do you want to be able to put food <laughs> on the table? Um, well, I'm a cheapskate, Tim. So, so I'm going. <laughs> with, I'm going with the value guy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm. I'm usually the bargain bin guy. Um, I don't buy the newest console. If I actually the last uh, video game console that I bought brand new was probably uh, Sega Genesis when I when I was. Uh, uh, it was around ten years old. So that. So I don't think that really accounts. <laughs> uh, uh, I do need to go with. Uh, I'd probably get killed by Jack Duffin if I didn't say Romeo Aquara. Uh, I hope he's listening right now because he's probably just really excited that I even said the name. Uh, Carlos Dunlap was just released by the. Uh, well, he he's now a free agent. He was with Seattle Seahawks, so he's mm-hmm. on the open market. He knows the division well. Uh, a guy who can play the run well enough. It has some pass rushing moves. That's great. Uh, another person who's actually had um, actually people are asking him if he wants to come play opposite Miles Garrett. Uh, Trey Hendrickson, who uh, is leaving the the Saints. So there there are plenty of options out there, especially in the value category. Um, I and I don't feel like this draft class. I'm not trying to dive into the draft class, but um, just just an over overarching take on this draft class is the defensive line slash edge 
players aren't really where you want to cut your teeth. And I, again, like I said earlier, I would be fine with just being good enough along the defensive line. So boy, even if a guy, um, I, I know this is back to the interior a little bit, but a guy like Indama can sue, if he's interest, if he's not going back to Tampa Bay, I'd be happy to just have a guy that's good enough along that defensive line to play next to Sheldon Richardson and Garrett. And I, I don't need the big flashy player. That's going to cost me 10 plus million a year. Well, so it would be a good, yeah. good thing to have Sue on our team rather than uh, playing dirty and kicking our guys while they're laying on the ground. So I'm, I'm on board with that. As long as he doesn't hurt anybody in practice, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a ton of guys on this list. I mean, you just go up and down this, uh, this list of, of rushers and you just have, I mean, you, you just got a feeling that, um, you know, the Browns are going to be able to get somebody that's going to, that's going to help, uh, help miles dramatically, which you help miles. You know, you help the defensive line, you and you help your, you end up helping your your DBs and everybody. So, it, you know, it's really a big, it's really going to be a huge addition whoever they decide to bring in. And I mean, we've only talked about half the guys. Um, guy we haven't talked about is uh, is Von Miller, and I guess I guess he's not really a free agent yet. And um, Tim, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but it looks to me like he's signed through this season but um but uh he's got uh um he's due 22 million and i think they can save 18 million on the cap i let him go by or trading him by by june so i think that's the speculation that the broncos might be ready to move on from him um, coming off an injury he's likely to be a cap casualty yeah yeah so um Von Miller's another guy that people would like to see in Cleveland. So I don't know what you guys think now. I I, I put Von Miller kind of in that JJ Watt category, uh, where it's 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 fun if you can have him. Uh, he he is another uh, toy that you add into the toy box. But at this point in his career, he definitely does still have some pass rushing moves. But. I, Boy, I, I do wonder his overall usefulness to this team, uh, especially at what is likely probably still going to be a significant cost. I don't know if I'm willing to put 13 to 15 million right on the table for him for a one year deal. I and, and really cost myself uh, again, trying to get those couple of extra guys in the back end of my defense. I, I don't know if I really want that. I'd rather have Leonard Floyd at the same money. Oh, I know, guys. I'm looking at this list, and man, a lot of these guys put up really nice numbers last year. You know, when you bring them to the Browns, you know, on, on the Browns defensive line, especially if you if you got Sheldon Richardson and and um, you know, and I don't know, you know, what else they'll do at the other uh, DT spot who will be there as the main starter. But um, man, the, you know, their numbers might even be better in Cleveland. So um, right, yeah. Well, yeah. it's hard to argue that Floyd would be better you know, than playing next to Aaron Donald, but um, I think he'd be a solid guy on our line. <laughs> well, Aaron Donald price do, you know, ends up taking a lot of tackles away from him, so Bray would be right. Yeah. Who wants to play next to Aaron Donald all the time? <laughs> <laughs> Guys who like being in the shadow. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. <laughs> So, and we really haven't talked, to, you know, about the defensive in, interior a whole lot other than, you know, our talk about Richardson. Um, you know, the Browns uh, with Ogan Joby probably moving on, you know, depending on what kind of offers he gets and depending on whether the Browns even want to bring him back. Um, Browns probably going to have a, a spot there. Uh, do you, Tim, do you think that would be addressed through free agency or you think it's more likely through the draft? Uh, I, I, I'm really hoping the, uh, the draft is where they go on, on this side of things as well. Probably a little bit later. Once again, I, I think really where the Browns can find themselves a winner is I, I, I would think back to the, to the term hog molly. 
uh, for the from the Giants GM and and those big nasties that are just up front. And I, I think that's the term he used. And and that's that's really what I would be looking for in the later part of the draft, uh, maybe with that second, third round pick or a, as they go into day three a little bit more. I I don't think you're going to really need to focus on the pass rush part of it because I wouldn't be surprised if the Browns do end up di- dipping their toe into that free agent side of things. Like I mentioned with Aquara and Hendrickson, the, those are just a couple of the many names that are out there. So I, they already have Jordan Elliott. They have Sheldon Richardson, who's definitely multiple. He can, he can play a little bit of edge, but he definitely also plays on the interior. I'm, I'm definitely just feel like get me a six, three, 330 pound guy, 6'2, 6'3, 330 pound guy that's a space eater. That, that's really just going to eat nice. up some blocks and be an effective run defender. I don't need you to uh, rush the passer. I don't need you to be effective in that part of your game. Isn't that Andrew Billings? Uh, oh, that's true. You, I forgot about you, him, honestly. You, yeah. you just that is him, but you just need more of him. And, and Jordan <laughs> and Jordan Elliott is is still a guy that's developing. Um, he for his size, he still looks slim. I, I hope he continues to put on a little bit more weight so he can just be um, a, a little bit more with his natural leverage. But uh, but yeah, there, there's plenty of room for still improvement to happen on the interior. Um, Jeff, do you have have your eye on any free agents, uh, DTs? You know, it's a pretty shallow pool. I think. Um, yeah, the the class is not is not deep at all. <laughs> right. I mean, that's not it's, great, it's, and you don't know what kind of what kind of contracts he's got. You know what the market's going to be. Um, I mean, you know if if the uh, if somebody like Sue wanted a one-year deal and the Browns could get him on a good deal, you know, that, that would be great. But, um, but yeah, I don't think they go, if you have, uh, you know, if you got Billings and, and Richardson, you know, and these guys here, I don't think you, I don't think you need to go big on a free agent defensive tackle. I think assuming just that, that Richardson plays out his contract. Yeah. Yeah. If he's or here gets, or gets re- renegotiated. Right. Right. Definitely. Okay, guys. Well, I think we've uh, we've covered defense, um, you know, just and I think that's pretty much where the Browns are going to go. But, you know, in the last few minutes here, uh, it, you know, we, we've we did talk a little bit of wide receiver. But, Tim, do you think the Browns could be active um, anywhere else on offense and free agency? Yeah, I, I I think they cleaned up really well last year. They double dipped on the tackle class with. Uh, with both bringing in Conklin and then also, <clears throat> pardon me, also signing, uh, drafting Wills, um, really firming things up. Uh, the most act- activity they could have is actually trying to find a way to to re-sign Wyatt Teller to some some type of extension, um, re-signing Baker Mayfield if that's that may be a possibility this off season, especially if they can get any type of discount to really uh, it, saying that. Who knows what the cap's really going to be? We will not pay you top five money. We will pay you top ten money. That's okay in my book. That can that can be a real long term savings, especially some of these quarterback contracts that usually look better down the road than they do when they when you first sign them. I, I'm looking at you, Jared Goff and Carson Wentz, as two guys who are no longer with their teams. But yeah. but but usually these contracts end up looking better the further on down the road like even the Dak Prescott one I'm sure at some point you're going to look at it and say you know what it is is quarterback prices go up it, it just becomes a little bit worse um I, I don't really see him being f- active on the tight end market <clears throat> they have three really solid options um two two strong starters and a developmental guy in Harrison Bryant who's going to see we'll see what happens going into the next year where I could see them, uh, the investment, like I mentioned right off the rip, was is the wide receiver position. Get me speed, big, big, fast. That that's what I need. Uh, someone who can just be that. P- I don't want Jamison Crowder walking through the door. Is another close to the line. I'm a scrimmage guy. Okay. I, I need someone who can work downfield. Give me John he Brown. He does pretty well in fantasy, though. Jamison Crowder. <laughs> 
he does. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Tim, but yeah. No, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I don't even, I'm kind of <laughs> just wondering if they would consider doing anything in the quarterback room. Just, uh, you definitely can't get out from underneath Case Keenum's contract, but what you might be able to do is, um, if there is someone cheap and developmental, I, I would more expect that in the draft. Not not really too excited in free agency to do something crazy like that. Um, but but again, they they really went hard at the offense last year. That's 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 really the imbalance that's happening with the Cleveland Browns right now. Even when you look at their uh, salary cap, like what they have devoted to it, there's uh, according to over the cap, they have 136. Point three million devoted to the offense 136 yeah Mm -hmm. defense has 55 it's (laughs) it's it's a little less than half well for everybody who watched the games we could we could kind of tell right and (laughs) and it's definitely an imbalance in the team and and there's ways to correct it but i really do agree with what both of you have said this is where where the team really starts to to fix that that imbalance and tip the scales back in the favor of the defense a little bit because as much as you want to get on Joe Woods's case for whatever game plan he came together uh, came up with last year, the fact is he didn't have the needed talent to run a quality defensive scheme, especially when you started talking about the guys that were off the field. Denzel Ward dealt with COVID. Greedy Williams wasn't there. Grant Delpit injury. I, I mean, the li- the list just keeps going on and on on the defensive yeah. side, which was already yeah. depleted. I, I I know it's easy to sit here and say, boy, did you see this game and what happened? I, I mean, they were just undermanned. They still did pretty darn good in some, you know, in some games too. You know, right. I For think sure. the defense, the defense, yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if we can say they won games for him, but I mean, it certainly kept him in a lot of games. So, right. you know, I, I was I was pretty happy overall. You know, considering how undermanned they were, and the fact that the defense really just plain wasn't addressed. Last I mean, Miles My- Garrett even dealt with COVID last year and and missed some time, and yeah. he he admitted to not coming back the same player he was at the beginning of the season. Yeah, that's, yeah, you could tell. Yeah, that's a detriment. Yeah, well, I think at uh, at wide receiver, you know, there have just been so many good wide receivers come out, you know, in the drafts recently, and uh, all these all these free agents. The Browns are going to find some, but you know, some, some players, and I don't think they're going to have to spend that much money. So I think, uh, you know, I could see them bringing in a, maybe, you know, maybe even a couple of uh, free agent wide receivers, but you know, they're not going to be big contract guys. But the big guys would, you know, with speed, um, you know, they just don't don't get the big deal that they're hoping for, uh, you know, or it might be the, the one year contract guys who, uh, you know, who are hoping to come in and do something and, and parlay it into, you know, maybe a bigger deal. So um, I'm optimistic about the wide receiver position, and I don't think they're going to do much else on offense. <laughs> the only thing I would add to that, Rod, you, you and I have alluded to it on uh previous podcasts is you know depending on what the market is for Wyatt Teller um, you know we could find ourselves replacing him um, with a value guy uh, toward the end of free agency Um, and a guy to keep his eye on keep your eye on you you mentioned it to me earlier today Rod Um, our old friend uh, Kevin Zeitler was released by the Giants today, I believe, right? Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, I mean, he made $12 million last season. Um, you wonder what kind of deal you could bring him in on um, if they had a hard time coming up with the money for Teller. He's 31. He's still playing at a high level. Yeah, I, I really struggle with this because – you know, because, um, you know, just how good the Browns offensive line is, how good their coach is, and, you know, the ability to, to um, you know, uh, possibly 
develop somebody else there too. But you know, you can't really mess around with that when you're trying to go deep into the playoffs. So, right. so yeah, I mean, there, there's potential that, that they could do something like that if they feel like they can't get it done with Wyatt Teller in a, in a mat, you know, in a manner that's going to, um, you know, it's going to work out for the Browns. Well, it's um, got to be sustainable, right? I mean, you've yeah. already got a lot of money committed on that line as well. Yeah. Yeah. The nice part about Teller, he is signed for 2021. Yeah. Um, obviously a holdout could, could easily happen considering his performance last year. Um, but, but Zeitler could be, uh, could be a definite option at, at this point, but I, I'm definitely not, um, I'm definitely not opposed to signing a 25 year old guard who, who played well last season. Yeah. I think when we went through the offensive line, Tim, we just saw, we've got, uh, you know, everybody, you, you know, other than the, you know, other than the Browns new left tackle is making, is making like 10 million a season. So, right. you yep. know, it's at some point, you know, how can you pay all these guys this much money or just going, you know, and then you're going to, going to extend, you know, Baker and, um, someplace you've got to figure out where to cut some money on offense eventually. So, um, you know, and then you got Chubb coming up. Um, you know, it, it's just a tough spot. So, um, we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I mean, I like Wyatt Teller. I like him to be here. Uh, you know, I want all these guys to be here, but, um, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> That's all I can say. So, uh, Tim, thanks for, thanks for joining us. I think we've, uh, kicked this around pretty well and, um, we'll see if anything we said comes to fruition <laughs> next week <laughs> or in the coming weeks. I mean, obviously these guys aren't all going to sign next Wednesday, you know, it'll, it'll drag out for a little bit, but, uh, definitely, uh, going to be fun watching to see what actually happens. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts for, for, uh, Anybody who happens to be listening, yeah, uh, I'll I'll just say uh, enjoy the ride. This is this is exciting. This is one of my my favorite times of year because it's just an absolute shift of the landscape. People are signed, people are cut, people are traded. It, it just feels like this in this is one of the biggest shifts that can happen uh, during an NFL season. Along, obviously, along with the NFL draft, but the idea of these changing landscapes is always something that, um, that I enjoy seeing because like we mentioned kind of at the start of the podcast, there's always a change that's happening. This, there's a reason this league keeps our attention and it's because it's not just because of the games, but it's because it's so exciting to, to see some of our favorite players and kind of what's going on with them. So, uh, so enjoy, really enjoy the ride. I, I know there's going to be a lot of podcast. We, we actually talked about it before we hit the record button. There, there's a lot, a million names that we could sit here and list. That's really not what we're looking for, and that's that's kind of why I mentioned like the Browns guardrails or or looking back at what they did last off season. I I, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that the process of what the Browns are doing now really feels right, because yeah. even though Sashi Brown was. Uh, wasn't here for for two years it's amazing to look at this team and realize that they're still using some of the carryover cap <laughs> that he brought on when uh when he was general manager a lot of the fingerprints that he established when he was with this team are still in place so um the, that's just one of those kind of different levels of thinking and making sure that your process and how you're really moving forward through it is right. And this team seems to really have it locked down. And I, I think that also builds with a lot of my excitement. Yeah. Shout out to Sashi Brown. Nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jeff, anything for us in closing tonight? I just had a, a thought about something that Tim mentioned earlier uh, with the salary cap dropping this year. Um, I, if, if talking round numbers, uh, if my math is right, about $20 million per team times 32 teams. Um, that's two high salary guys per team or 64 guys that are unlikely to get the contract that they would have gotten had it gone the other way. Uh, if not for COVID and 
everything else that brought the salary cap down. Um, so the fact that the Browns have salary cap space this year um, is really exciting to see what kind of guys they can get on what kind of contracts over the next couple of weeks. And we're going to be seeing some pretty exciting things added to the organization. Uh, and they won't be head coaches and GMs. For a change. Yeah. Right. <laughs> excellent points. Uh, excellent points to close on, guys. All right. This has been the Browns Blitz. We will catch you next time. Yeah.